So, yeah, we have our first guest ever on the What's the Buzz podcast. My dad, Daryl Bell. Good morning. Daddy. Good morning. Yeah. It is an honor to be here. <laughs> you said that with so much passion. You should. Enthusiasm. This first segment is brought to you by Grace Hill Coffee. Yes. Please get your all, all guests on the What's the Buzz podcast get a, a mug. <laughs> well, he's technically speaking, he's not the first guest. Who was the first guest? Brady. Brady's not a guest, he's staff. He's staff, but he's a guest on the podcast. Okay. Yeah. So you're the second guest. Second guest. So I let your mug back afterwards. It took a lot of the. <laughs> Out of it, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not so special anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what well, you guys got? Then? Well, we were just talking about how special your son is. Indeed, you said you said in fact he was a challenge. He was challenged as a child. Yeah. Yes. Well, I thought he was. So because of uh, I don't know if you've ever witnessed his son Beckett. But Beckett makes would would have made what Buzz was at that age calm. He was a live wire to say the least. So <laughs> we uh, numerous numerous meetings with uh, teachers and and principals on his activity, and, and it wasn't he wasn't me. I mean, he was just that's how he got his nickname because he was like a. Bumblebee just could not hold still. So uh, I think it was fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade, fourth grade. Uh, his sister was tested uh, and uh, for her IQ and determined that she was gifted. Mm-hmm. And so she was going to go to gifted classes. And I think it started out as a joke when the teacher said, hey, why don't we test Justin too? <laughs> And uh, oh, a wink, wink. As a <laughs> We're just throwing it all out there. So I thought, wow, that's a waste of time. But yeah, let's do that. And, uh, Does it cost anything to test him? No, it's free. <laughs> yeah, how about it? How about it? So to our amazement, and we did ask him to, to recount the test several times, he ended up coming out higher than his sister. So he was gifted. And uh, so they wanted to put him in gifted classes. And and I felt bad because all that time I thought he was, I gave him a break because I thought he was challenged. He was so active. And uh, um, so then I found out it was just, you know, oh, he's got it inside of him. Now we just got pulled out. It For a lot of, for a lot of people who are gifted in that way, they're bored. Yeah, they're just bored because they can get through work, like school work bored them, mm-hmm. especially in, in elementary school. I'm not speaking for myself, by the way. I'm speaking of like, people I know. <laughs> but, but they'd be bored in, with the schoolwork, and so they'd find themselves getting in trouble or kind of bouncing all over the place. Um, so, kind of like Einstein, you know, they thought he was a dunce. Right. Right? I've read that, yeah. So that's... Mm-hmm. That's not me, no. I'm not Einstein. <laughs> Is it in that you're just not reaching your full potential? <laughs> I, I clearly have not reached my full potential, but yeah. I'll vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I do have I have a question for you as it relates to that. <laughs> so you watch? <laughs> just, yeah, right. Did you just wink? Yeah, <laughs> trying to help sell sell the gear. That's here. right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about marketing. <laughs> Am I right? It's marketing, right? I know. I've been trying to teach him this. Uh-huh. Yeah. I've been trying to teach him this. You watch his sermons every week? Not, not every week. Not but every we week. do uh, We do watch a lot of the sermons. Okay. So. And, and give a lot of feedback. <laughs> yes. Would you say that's not all receptive? Really? Can, would you say it's constructive Criticism is it positive feedback? Generally speaking, it's it's but well, I mean, um, just incredibly uh, proud, and, and it, it takes it, it pushes me back when I uh, actually see him do a sermon because I, I, 
you know, maybe I'm partial. I think they're they're great. And I, I love to see it. It's easier for me to listen to it because when I'm watching, then it brings up a lot of, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, that's the knucklehead. I know he wrecked my car. And then, you know, but to, to hear the sermon, you know, when I can just hear it. Um, but uh, I've told him from the beginning, I have offered my services that, that if he would give me the sermon beforehand, I'd like to add a little meat to it. There's some things that I think that I could help him with, but I would think he's, so. He's prideful. <laughs> well, that so, we know. So his not, first not, comment every you're week not getting is his best because he won't allow me to help him. <laughs> <laughs> his first comment every week is, "Hey, you know, you could have brought up me in that sermon and my story here of like it's always I could have been in the sermon, but there's but so many of the sermons reflect that's things that I've done wrong." That's true. You do bring him up quite. I a do. Bit. I do talk about yeah. him a lot. Yes, and I appreciate the shout out. <laughs> often, often, Daryl, many times. Uh, what do you think about the next time you're in town on a Sunday? If we can have you up on the platform, sitting in a chair, with your own microphone, and then when he says something that's, eh, you can just like hold your finger up as a fact checker. A live fact well, You mean like the old men and Muppets? Oh, that's <laughs> even better. <laughs> like just have a, Can we build a balcony? <laughs> right, just having commentary. That sermon wasn't bad. It wasn't good either. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> That'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you're obviously very proud of him. Very proud. Do you think that he would have made... Now... now Eternal consequences aside, do you think that he would have made a better attorney than a pastor? I don't. I, no, no, I don't. I don't see. I don't think that that path would have ever. I don't think he would have got far on that path. I just don't see uh, that in him. But I would say that um, whatever he did choose to do, um, I just think that that law wouldn't have been. I think we would have been out. I would have the wayside like being a meteorologist. Um, uh, but I think he would have been really great at no matter where where he ended up. I mean, you know, the personality, the people person, the, um, yeah. It would have been good for the co-workers. I think as a management would have a lot of difficulty no matter where he went. So... Uh, <laughs> As far as like his problem with authority, well, I think <laughs> him and HR would have been. Uh, <laughs> well, we should ask Brady actually because Brady was HR, HR for, for the first years. number, and I'm sure yeah. he's taken several notes. And mm -hmm. yeah, so you had a question. You said um, that you uh, ran across Greg and Sheila Taylor last evening, correct? Yeah, they came over last right. night. Yeah, and that they had questions. For you, Daryl, did they pose the questions to him already? Or yeah, did they just pass them along. No, to they they already asked him. Yeah. Okay, so would you mind? Yeah, Sheila Sheila's question was she wanted to know. Would you, sit? Would yes. you come this way? I'm sorry, I got I've got a great shot of Daryl. Am I in? Yes, there okay. we go. Yep. All right. She. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are all like, <laughs> oh, we can do it. <laughs> Sheila asked. So if you if you have listened to the podcast or come to church, you know a little bit of my story. That, um, and, and for those that don't, basically, um, I was at UCF. I was a year and a half in. Um, it was a Thursday night, and I had just found out that I was going to flunk my math class, and I knew I was done. Like, I knew I was done, mm -hmm. uh, and so I had to call my dad that night and tell him I'm flunking out of school. Like, you need to come get me on Saturday. I'm done. Yeah. And <clears throat> and so then, that night, I prayed because I got, I got a good, I got a good um, chastisement that night. <laughs> uh, Deserved. Well, I was going to say. Deserved. Yeah, understandable. Um, and, uh, and so I, I hit my knees that night because the last thing he said to me on the phone was, okay, I'll come to get you on Saturday. Like, you're, you're not coming home. You're doing something. What are you going to do? You know, like, yeah, I want an answer on that, Saturday. On Saturday. When he arrived, yeah. you had to know what it was going to be. He was like, you're you're doing something. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to do? Um, and so I hit my knees that night and prayed. And it was the first time I had prayed in a long time. Mm -hmm. 
And that was the night that I had a dream that God told me to be a pastor. So when I woke up in the morning, I, I called my home pastor and told him. And he was like, that's awesome. Like, call your dad and tell him. I was like, oh, let's <laughs> uh, give it a day. Yeah, but but I in my in my story, you know, like I talked about, like that was that was a moment that I was like, okay, God, miracle number one, mm-hmm. like this conversation needs to go up, you know, like, and so I called Dad. And I said that that was just what I led with was, Dad had a dream last night. I'm supposed to be a pastor, and um, and so 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 her her question to him was, okay, oh jeez, okay, so like. How did you respond to all that? Like, what was going through your head through all that? Because, you know, you just chewed out your son the night before. He's calling. You're having to pick him up in a day, you know, because it's Friday morning. You know, you're having to pick him up in a day to, like, how how serious did you take that? How, you know, like, what was your whole reaction to that? That was taken away. So uh, we remember the story just a little bit different because um, I remember him calling. But the conversation before that is if grades did not improve, I come up and get him. We're pulling him out of school. And uh, so he, he kind of knew that's where it was heading. And when he, he called and, and knew that there was no way that we would not find out that he failed math and that he was painted in a corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when he called me, uh, you know, I, I said, that's it. You know, we're, we're, we're coming to get you. You know, we're just wasting money here. And you know, Tony, you know, you, you do have to find something. But when he had called and uh, and had told me about the dream, I thought, well played. You know, you talk about pulling a rabbit out of your hat. Uh, you know, I mean, this was not, you know, I just, this sounded like a desperation, Hail Mary, no pun intended, uh, shot, you know, to stay in school. You know, because he, he wanted to stay at UCF. And... Uh, and then he started talking to me a little bit more about it on the phone and, and telling me, and, uh, and I could tell he was serious. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, you know, it was a, a conversation, a deep conversation I don't think that we had ever had, you know, where he was really pouring out what he had felt. And, and it, it took me by surprise. And I told him that we would talk about it, you know, when I, when I got up there. And uh, by the time that, that we had talked about it, um, you know. I mean, I saw you came up to pick me up on Saturday, right? And he, you know, he had his stuff loaded, and and the <clears> fact <throat> that just the whole vibe of, of when I picked him up, he he was calm. He knew that this was you know going to happen, but I still, you know, I mean, I still thought that I was very uh, skeptical yeah. of of the whole thing. But when we talked about it. And, uh, and I could see it in his eyes. Um, you know, I told him that uh, at that point, you know, I wrote a check that I did not know I was going to catch. I said, whatever it takes. And uh, so, you know, we're going from, uh, he, he had prepaid college. Uh, he had some scholarship. So we're going from virtually uh, a free education because of his, his grades and, and what we had put money aside to a private school. Uh, in Texas, in Texas, <clears throat> and uh, that was going to be a hard sell, and, and especially to his mom. And I told him that I would, I'd fight that fight for him, and uh, you did. But you know, he came back and he went to uh, junior college. Mm-hmm. You know, we signed up for the semester in junior college. He, and this was, you know, he did all the legwork to find out about Concordia, what what it needed, what it was. Um, our home church. Uh, He's very close with his uh, his pastor, uh, Pastor John, and his he's got four boys. But that's uh, Buzz's best man. Is his uh, yeah. yeah? I mean, they were really really close. So, really, John's his mentor, and, and uh, the church immediately uh, um, set aside funds to help him. And so, this was going to happen. This was going to happen. And uh, and you know, Buzz is right. That was the first true God moment. Um, this path, and it was so for me. Um, you know, what father doesn't want to believe in his son? Mm. You know, so d- to be able to dig in and believe in that and, and to fight for him, and, and you know, we smoothed over his mom and who made valid points. They were all valid points about, you know, this is crazy, but 
you know, every step that every challenge he had to make from that point, you know, just get into Concordia, finishing Concordia, you know, you know, nothing was given to him. He worked in the bookstore, he, you know, he part-time jobs, he did whatever it took and, and got into the sim. And so, so at what point did you say like, okay, he's going to make it? Oh, or, it like, when did you believe like, Hey, he's going to, he's going to do this faster thing and it's going to, it's going to work out. I think that I had an inkling during the vicarage, but at graduation, I thought you were going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. At that point, I thought, hey, this way, if someone will take him. <laughs> but but there was there were some hurdles, though, because there were, there were some classes in the sim, and, and we were talking about last night, but, uh, you know, he took uh, three years of uh, Spanish, Mm-hmm. in high school and couldn't order from Taco Bell. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, languages, but when he had Hebrew and Greek, okay. and they were monster classes. And, I mean, I honestly did not know just any possible way he was going to pass those classes. And, and you talk about a God thing. I, we were joking about it, but when he passed Hebrew, mm-hmm. and I think he got a D minus, 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 <laughs> we celebrated <laughs> We hit the lottery. <laughs> but he got through it. He got through it. It was tough, but he got through it. Yeah. The first time around, too. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, you know, all those were God things. And every time he would cross one of those hurdles, um, you know, it, you could really see God's hand in, uh, in what, what was going on. Like each one was like a launching point. It's like another success, another win. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What did, what did it feel like to you to be given, you know, we'll call it a second chance. It's probably more than that. But what did it feel like to you to have, to have that? Well, I, I mean, I would say, I mean, let's support, be, but yeah. also like the, the weight. It was. Like, I, I it cannot was. blow this. It, it, it was heavy because I, I knew I knew I had squandered everything at UCF. I knew I had disappointed them. Um, and I, I was embarrassed. I mean, my other roommates were doing just as much partying and, and skipping. And, you know, we were going out and surfing. And, you know, like we were. And, and yet they were passing classes. Mm-hmm. And, like, I was the one that had to go home. You know, like I wasn't cutting it. I was, I was pretty embarrassed. And, um, and. I mean, he's right. Like my, my mom, my stepdad, my stepmom, they they had a really hard time buying it at first, and mm-hmm. and, and justifiably so. Right. Like I don't, I don't, but it cuts me up. Yeah, and he didn't give up on me. Yeah. And he believed in me, and he fought for me because he did. And and I knew he was taking heat, and and that's what really was like. Man, like I can't let him down. Yeah, like. He's standing there being called a fool, you know, like, you know, like, Buzz isn't going to do this. He's not going to, like, I mean, this kid that, you know, just spent the last year and a half being a drunk, Mm -hmm. like, he's going to be a pastor and you're, you're, you're supporting this and you're, the dad did, he he didn't give up on me. And um, I think that, you know, I needed that. I needed somebody that. That was going to reaffirm because I questioned it. Of course. You know, when I had the dream, I laid there for two hours going, that was my imagination. Right. Like, how seriously should I take that? Like, because I, I never thought I would be a pastor. I never thought that was for me. Um, and and I thought everything I had been up to like disqualified me. Yeah. You know? And and I felt I felt behind the eight ball all the time. Um, with with you know being at <clears throat> being at Austin and all the other guys, you know, like they always dreamed of being a pastor. They you know it was their life path, right? And they they knew so much more than I did. Right. They you know were reading church fathers when they didn't have to, you know, and stuff like that. And I'm like, what church father is that? Who is that? You know, they're like, you don't know who Melanchthon is, and I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> who who's Melanchthon? You know, like, um, and a lot of them were lifelong. Lutherans also. Right. Yeah. I mean, boys born right. into the church and, and you know, you weren't. No. 
So I, I was always catching up, and that and that's that is something that yeah, part of our church body, and you, you well know this, I'm sure now too, that um, that that is very typical. Not only um, are a lot of our pastors, you know, growing, you know, they're born into the church, but their fathers or, and their grandfathers <clears throat> were pastors. Pass the down. Yep. Yeah, it's a generational thing, um, family, mm-hmm. family thing yeah. for sure, and so. Yeah, and you, you had a lot of things stacked against you. Yeah, for sure. We had a, uh, I don't know if you did catch this, um, but we had a, a message recently about suffering and trials and how, how God uses those to mold and shape mm-hmm. us. And, uh, and so when you're talking about that season of your life, mm-hmm. that was certainly, from my perspective, what God was doing. It's like, that's where you were, that's what you were doing at that time, but that's not who you were going to be. Mm-hmm. And God did absolutely use that that time in your life to, to bring you here. Well, I think that, uh, you know, Pastor John had said, you know, in one of the times we were talking with him, you know, that, you know, Justin was running from God. Mm-hmm. You know, because he said, you know, he believed, and I think he told you the night that you called him, that he always knew this would be your path. This is this was his path. Oh, really? Just how were you going to get there, <laughs> right? So then you think of some of the great people in the Bible, you know, Jonah, mm-hmm. who, you know, all the people that ran from God, like, no, 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 you must mean someone else. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always look at it, this was his, you know, in the back of his mind saying, man, you know, that sounds good, but I... Let me see if I can't do this first or uh, go do this. And no, you know, it you know, it was all for a reason and uh, to lead us to this point. Yeah, it wasn't without purpose you know, or design. And I, and I think that was the other big, big part of it was it wasn't just my home church that financially stepped up. It was individuals. I mean, we had elderly people step up and write massive checks. <laughs> That were like, we have always wanted this for you. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, I carried that weight of like, you know, the, oh. I think like the Orthmans yeah. and, and, you know, my, my, I worked at a law firm um, and, and the guy I worked for, like, he wrote a big check. Like, he wasn't disappointed I wasn't going into law. Like, he was like, yes, go be a pastor. You know, like, he was one of the elders of the church and he wrote a big check, you know. So, like, it was like, oh, I can't fail now. Like, I got people financially invested in me doing this. Well, when your car was sold, the church stepped up and bought yeah. you a car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when my car got stolen the uh, the first month at seminary, and my <laughs> whole church got me a new car. Mm-hmm. Yep. There, there's something to be said about um, getting that second, third chance, whatever it happens to be, and, and that being the motivation and you know, always thinking about just the support and, and the love that you have, and that can really carry you through. But man, that's a lot of burden to carry too. Mm-hmm. You had a lot of people who were investing in you, and not not people to let down. Yeah. And sometimes that people can crumble under that. So I, I, I think that that's probably another example of just kind of like molding and forming you, um, because you got a lot of people that are counting on you here. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and and if. I think that if, if you go into, and this is probably this probably happens, I don't know. But if you go into ministry without ever having a real trial, without having burden, without experiencing um, you know hurdles or stumbles or falling down or whatever it happens to be, um, and then you get you have kind of an easy path into it, and then you're carrying a lot of the, the burdens of of, uh, of the church family, uh, that can be overwhelming mm-hmm. and push people to, to a breaking point and push them out, quite yeah. frankly. So it, it's not without uh, purpose and design, for sure. And, and also, you know, I just want to make sure, you know, he talks about all the weight that he carried, you know, through, through that on his back, but... This is this is one of the things that I love about him is that even with all of that, you know, that's where you see Buzz. That's where you see Justin come through because he enjoyed 
he's enjoyed. He's been very blessed uh, through high school. He had a great time when he was at. He always made the best of the situation, right? I mean, you know, he played sports. He got cut from the team. He, you know, he got cut from the basketball team. He's a. And he used to be a really fantastic basketball player, but he's a little height t- challenged. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. <laughs> It's frequently brought up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and he got cut and it crushed him. You know, he got cut. So what's he do with it? Less than a week, he joins the swim team yeah. and ends up becoming, you know, captain of the swim team. I mean, so, you know, one thing leads to another all through college. You know, you enjoyed, you played sports. You, you know, wherever you went, you made the best of it. Um, so it wasn't like Martin Luther, you know, who was tortured because of his, his beliefs and stuff, you know, that just you know, ground him into the ground. Um, now, you know, I mean, you had a, a good time. I did. Yeah, I did. So, Well, that was actually one of the questions that was posed. Um, is swimming. <laughs> Bob. Bob asked, was like, he wanted to know, <clears throat> was he actually a decent swimmer? He was not you swim from, how early did you guys start swimming? You were, we were, him and his sister were Danielle were yeah, we on did, the swim team. We did travel swimming from yeah. like second to fifth grade, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. And uh and he was a, a decent swimmer. I mean, you know, you're talking about endless miles in the pool. You know, in Florida swimming is a huge thing. But uh in high school he was he was a a good swimmer. He his butterfly, uh he's a little weak on his butterfly stroke. It, it's more like a, a a wounded moth uh in the water, but but he, he he did get enough of it to qualify as a, a an official stroke, but uh yeah. he was a pretty good swimmer, wow. but uh you're not really built like a swimmer, you know. No. And I, that's the beauty of it. I, I yeah. was when I when I started swimming again in high school, I was way behind the eight ball because a lot of those kids had been swimming all that time, and so the only thing I could really compete at was the spring. Yep. The the fifty spring. Mm-hmm. That was the only mm-hmm. thing that I could actually compete with everybody at. All the long distance stuff, like they were just so far ahead of me. Right. And I was I was too far behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now he didn't have your typical swimmer's body, but mm-hmm. um, again. Uh, he made the captain of the team. You know, all of his uh, fellow swimmers loved him, yeah. and he enjoyed it. You know, and he did not let that hold him back. Just like yeah. at Concordia, <laughs> he was on the tennis team. I don't think he ever played tennis, <laughs> and they needed tennis players to make a. They had enough girls, but right. they needed more boys in order to have a tennis team. Okay, <clears throat> and so my roommate was like, "Hey, let's let's play tennis." And I was like, oh, sure, I've never played. Um, and so I ended up going like three and 21, I think, mm-hmm. over three years. Mm-hmm. I want I but I won a couple. Mm-hmm. It was, and, and that, that was fun. It's fun, yeah. Because, you know, at D3 level, we drive ourselves in SUVs, like we just rent cars, and we drive ourselves to these small little Texas towns, mm-hmm. and we play this, you know, weekend tournament. And, it, it, and you say you were a collegiate athlete. I was. I was. Right. But it was, it was fun. And you came out to a couple of tennis yeah. matches. And, yeah. 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 Um, did you, so going back to being captain of the swim team, obviously his position now, did he always have leadership qualities, even as a little kid? Yes. Rallying other little kids, you know, sort of being the leader of the group. Like, what was that like? Not, o- not overwhelming. You know, I mean, it wasn't the, the old, you know, my way or no way, this is, you know, but the leadership naturally came out as the event would start, you know, and, and I think that people uh, kind of rally or, or, or kind of follow behind, you know, I, I don't want to use the analogy of sheep because sheep aren't the smartest animals, but, you know, that sheep and, and shepherd type like, oh yeah, you know, and you know what they say, you put 10 people in a room with a problem. You're going to find out who your leader is mm-hmm. because that's you know that's the person that and uh, he would be he would be that person but not in a like I said not in an overwhelming not like a dominant no like I'm no. taking the reins kind of thing yeah building advocacy probably right. just relationally what uh, one of the things that uh, that I like about him um, and there are only a few but one of the things I really appreciate about appreciate about him is that he 
is really good relationally with multiple generations. Right. So whether it's my kids who mm-hmm. love him dearly, you know, like my, my kids, uh, long before today, you know, they're, they're about, <clears throat> goodness, how old are they? 10, 12, 14, almost, yeah, 10, 12, 14, almost, and 18. They, they've always wanted to come to church when he's preaching. They didn't want to go to kids' church. They wanted to sit through the actual, and it wasn't because dad was playing music of any kind. It was because they really loved him and he was relatable, you know, but it wasn't like he was ever talking down to them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or patronizing because you know, he was delivering a message to everybody in the room. Right. And I think that's, uh, it takes a special person not only to, to be able to, be able to relate to multiple generations in worship, but then also to jump in when this church was a lot smaller and like be willing to do all the things, youth, right. uh, you know, high school youth, middle school youth. Right. Um, and I think kids are attracted to him because he's at that level. And I, do you mean in, height wise? <laughs> no. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> You're here, Chris. Both. And I think sadly, part of it is, is that he is at that level <laughs> of, of the kids. And I think that's why older people tend to uh, cling to him because he's at that level. <laughs> they think, wow, he can use some help. And, and, you know, so. Uh, it just kind of oozes out of him, so yeah. But mm-hmm. I think that's why people tend to uh, relate to him. There's something to be said about that, um, particularly for for a brand new church, because if you have if you have somebody who um, who is able to um, who you can be friends with, you know, uh, as your pastor, which I know is, is kind of a difficult balance for him too. I imagine we talked about it a little bit, but. Um, but you think of him as your friend and your pastor, and that's not just people his you know age, his peers. It's also people generations older right. and, and generations younger. They think of him as a friend, mm-hmm. you know, and that's uh, that's what makes him special. I mean, my intent was to come in here and just like make fun of him the entire time, but this is fun too. This is it, fun it's too. easy to do. So I mean, <laughs> there are lots of things. So kudos to you for reframing. <laughs> so we did have another question. Speaking of. Uh, this this is actually four questions uh, from Rich Hoffman. Oh boy! Um, and and we 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 before we started recording, we talked about some of this. But uh, his question is about Pastor Justin's conspiracy theory ideas, such as the moon landing being fake. We'll that get into that. Is so true. That's and he wanted to know: is this conspiracy theory a family belief or something that Pastor Justin picked up along the way? What about Roswell, JFK, the, the Flat Earth? Um, I am not Flat Earth. I you're not Flat Earth. I am not Flat Earth. Daryl, how do you feel about the Flat Earth theory? <laughs> I'm not Flat Earth either. I've, yeah. yeah. But let's talk about the moon landing. Well, what moon landing? That's all I got to say about that. I mean, is it, come on. That was out in the middle of the desert somewhere. So, But I, I think that that's, that's common knowledge. I mean, is there anybody <laughs> who really believes in that? Tell, tell me more. <laughs> so, I will say this, Mr. Hoffman, that NASA has come out since the moon landing and said that most of the pictures and most of the video that is shown today is of a studio video shoot and picture shoot that they did just in case the cameras weren't working on the moon and, you know, pictures didn't develop, that they, they did in a Hollywood studio, shoot and and take pictures in a Hollywood studio. Um, that is undeniable. NASA okay. has come out and said that, that, you know, pictures and textbooks and stuff like that are of that. And when you think about it, I mean, you, you have these, these you know, uh, astronauts that are having to, like, hop around and stuff and yet their their the camera was hold, uh, was mounted on their their suit there mm-hmm. and they're having to hold this focus this you know like they, they don't hold it up and look like mm-hmm. and take accurate like how clear they, how pictures, they those accurate pictures and and that nasa has come out and said yes we did shoot some stuff in a Studio. i think that makes the whole thing suspicious okay so you think it's suspicious but I 100% think we've been to the moon. Okay. On the moon. Oh, yes. Okay. Daryl? No, I'm not 100%. <laughs> Where do you? 
Where are we on this? I'm going to say maybe 30, 30% that we were actually on To this day that we haven't gone to the moon. To this day. I think, okay, so we go to the moon, we send up a bunch of stuff to the moon. How come no other country's been bouncing around up there? How come we There are other countries. Have there on been? the moon? Yes. China's gone. People. Away. People. No. They've went around the moon. People. I don't think anyone else has landed on the moon. And I think to your point, Daryl, why haven't we been able to get back? Exactly. That's my question. A hundred percent we've been back. Since when? I'm saying just because they didn't tell us that they went back. Oh. Oh. Yes. Yes, we've been back. So what you're saying is perhaps it's like a PSYOP thing. Like we've been back and we've been establishing some kind of military base on the dark side of the moon and we can't tell anybody because then people are susceptible and then the Chinese or the Russians or whomever else can get and infiltrate and then, is that, is that what you're saying? I believe that there are structures on the dark side. On the dark side, yes. Because Daryl, didn't, you were saying, I mean, that was 60 it? years ago. You know, we have pictures of the, dark, of the dark side of the moon. Exactly. Like clearly we have the abilities. Mm-hmm. Right. Explain that. Yeah. So you're saying because there's, there's stuff they don't want us to see. Up there somewhere. <laughs> I'm saying there's stuff they don't want us to With see. With a continental breakfast. <laughs> I just don't believe that we have had access to the moon for 60 oh, years and we haven't done anything up there. My, I, I agree with that. Okay. I believe we have been up there doing <laughs> stuff. Well, I believe we haven't because we haven't had the original access to the moon. I think that we were on the moon when we went on the... Uh, um, trip to the desert. I think that's where it was filmed. I thought I seen some of you know, when I, yeah. the, I thought I seen some of the NASA stuff there that they left behind at that so point. So you don't even think it was a studio. You think it was come on. Desert. Wow, this is deep. I love this. Okay. We can go on about that. And maybe JFK. He said JFK, right? JFK. I am a firm believer in a second shooter on the grass, you know, behind okay. the fence. Absolutely, it has to be a second shooter. Okay, so do you think that, that perhaps the U.S. government was involved? Yes. I don't want to say that. I just, that, that hurts too much to think that. But, no, I don't want to say that. Not directly. But we'll put it that we'll way. We'll take this offline. <clears throat> Not directly. It'll be members only recording. Yes. You got to pay. Folks, you got to pay for the access to this. For the blue check. Mark. That's right. So are you putting a disclaimer on this at the views and in we, comments? We should say that. This is just for fun. This is just our personal. The views and comments. I, I, I've right already said it. on the podcast that I do think there was a second shooter. This is not for fun. This is dead serious. <laughs> this is Graysell's belief. Okay. If you come to Graysell, you have to. There are black ones. SUVs in the parking lot. That's right. right now. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if one drove by right now, <laughs> we'd shut this thing down and lock that door. Um, okay. Question number two. <laughs> I don't know what this one um, <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'll ask it. What, <laughs> what advice? What advice does Mr. Bell have on how Pastor can step his game up um, so that he can... <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like rewording it. Mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing. Um, he's, he's alluding to the fact that you outkicked your coverage with your wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And, and so um, he's saying something to the effect of, let's all be honest, she settled. So... <laughs> Um, how, what advice can you give to, to your son about how he might be able to step up his, his game? I don't know if he's talking about like wearing, wearing fancier clothes or, um, I, I, what, I don't know what he's alluding to. Bell men are known for snagging some, (laughs) we have all reached way above (laughs) That's just a key. It's a curse. It's, I mean, it's, it's a, a curse. curse. <laughs> and we tell Hudson and back at the same thing. Scott yeah. help you, it's a curse. Oh. So, uh, but um, yeah, I think that, you know, going back talking about him making it through seminary, I think the biggest God thing that we've seen is mm-hmm. Johanna, somehow the blindness and, and that she had at the time that they were dating. <laughs> and, 
you talk about answer to prayers that someone would take him and take care of him and get him off of our payroll. <laughs> oh my gosh. She was she is the biggest God said we absolutely she love her to death. Yeah. She is a fantastic mom and still tolerates him. Um I don't see how. All right. And we 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 put money back so we can pay her off if we have to at any point. Kind of like a reverse dowry. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, she is. She's great. Universally loved. Mm. For sure. Uh, number three. <laughs> what did you think Pastor Justin would grow up to be? Or was he so bad that you were wondering how many years in in prison, he would serve. That's I'm reading this one. <laughs> no, he was he was never to the point that we thought he was going to do uh, would be in prison. Now maybe some jail time. You know, uh, he'd maybe do a little jail time. You know, for a year or under. But we never, <laughs> thought, he'd make, right. never thought he'd make it into prison. <laughs> time served, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't. He he was never never like that. Uh, you know, I mean the the issues that we had with him growing up were uh, mild compared to uh, some of his fellow friends and stuff. But, I mean, but don't mistake, he did not walk on water. He did not. He, uh, he, he challenged us all the time. But um, what did I, you, Yeah, what did you think I was going to be? I honestly, at, at first, I thought that you would go into, I can see you as a used car salesman. You, you make a really good used car salesman. <laughs> that goes for a lot of pastors, really. <laughs> But that's in the that's in the blood. That is in the blood. You mm-hmm. sold cars and I, uncle I did for sold cars. Yeah, yeah, and you got a couple uncles. But mm-hmm. honestly, I thought there was a for quite a while. We really thought that uh, being a meteorologist, he loved weather, always loved weather, and actually, you know, looked into taking some classes. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, beyond that, it's it's hard to he he wasn't one of those kids who. You know, it was just dead focus on being a, a pilot, dead focus on being an astronaut or a fireman, you know, all of his life, um, which was good. You know, he, he found things that interested him. He dabbled in them a little bit and went on. Um, you know, we, we always hoped that he would uh, um, follow the path into the ministry. But, um, you know, there was a, a point, you know, at high school and college that, that didn't look like the path, and, and we didn't know where it would lead back to. But uh, I knew that whatever he did go into, he'd be good at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, I got I got a deep question for you. It was not a mystery to you that I was I was messing up in college big time. Well, from all the times that me and your mom drove up there to chastise you, no, it was no mystery. Okay. Really? So, so how did, how did so, you? Yeah. How in your mind, like during that season, how did you decide when to be patient? How did you decide when to step? Like, how did you, did you lose hope during part of that? Did you like, or how, how did you handle that? Or how do you think? Cause, cause there are parents out there that are going through that right now that their kids are acting a fool and they're like, is this a phase? Are they going to grow out of this? Do we hold on to hope? Do we step in and like, what, what advice would you give? That's a long time ago, but I think that number one, there's no set answer, right? So you got to know, you got to know your kids and there's a fine line between, um, turning them loose from high school and, and I mean, we, we're, I would say that we were pretty fairly tight reined, you know, I mean, we kept good track of our kids in high school. So you're turning them loose, uh, to go up and, and to live on their own. And so there's some, you have to be able to give a little bit of leadway. That, that it's going to be a learning curve. You know, then they're going to have to pick up. You got to know when it gets serious for them that this is my future. And the point that we pulled the plug or I pulled the plug is when I thought this is going to get to the point where it's going to hurt him, his future. Yeah. Like, you know, we're heading down a path where, you know, this is going to hurt his future. We need to reset the clock here. We, you know, we got to come back and reset, refocus. And, uh, and, and luckily for us, that's what it took. 
Um, that reset that, you know, the enjoyment that he had for that year and a half. And, but he knew at that point, and again, this goes back to knowing your kids. He knew at that point that, you know, we're talking about my future. We, we need to get serious here. And uh, we did not let it just continue, you know, where we have two years, two and a half years, three years of failing grades and we're just pouring money into this. You got to be strong enough to pull that plug yeah. and snap their head around and, sure. and for that. that you, you're right. There, um, there are people, I think it's a pretty typical circumstance where, um, you know, if, if you had pretty tight reins on high school in particular, mm-hmm. they go out to school. They have that sense of freedom, you know, mm-hmm. right off the bat. Um, to know that they're going to mess up, you know, they're going to fall through, they're going to struggle, and where to draw that line of th- this is something they can learn from, this is something they can grow from, versus this could be irreparable. You know, this could be this could do enough damage for for the decades to come, right. versus like weeks, months, right. that kind of thing. And I think one of the things that one of the mistakes that parents make or, or one of the things that they they put too much uh, weight in is what other people would think. So we didn't care what Justin's friends would think. We didn't care what the other people in the church would think, you know, when we brought him back home. Uh, and I think a lot of parents let it ride because, you know, they the stigma, they don't want people to know that things aren't good. And, and it was too important to us you know, to, you know, just let it ride because we were worried about what other people would think or to see our failures or challenges. And uh, it didn't matter. And in the long run, it it didn't matter. I mean, you know, it, it, there was no harm, no foul, no no bruising, you know, because you had to come home. You know, I mean, he continued, he went to church and people just knew that things didn't go well there and we're going to reboot and do something else. Right. And, uh, and, and likely had the type of impact that uh, that we've discussed already that mm-hmm. helped shape him, push him, motivate him, drive him to where he is. Right. Yeah. Since we're doing this, I'm going to ask two more questions. And you don't have to share a lot if you don't want to, Pop. But your childhood was pretty rough. You had a rough upbringing. Um, and then... You, you move into the adult world, and I think most people would look at you, you and mom, and say, okay, you, you've raised a pastor and a speech pathologist, you know, who have their masters, you know, and, you know, and when they understand that your childhood, you grew up, um, you know, there wasn't food in the house, there was, there was abandonment, there was neglect, there was abuse, there was a lot of things that you grew up with. How do you see that journey for you going? How do you see God at work in that? What would you say to people that have had those type of struggles and how you, what in your mind allowed you to push through and to, in one generation, not model or or fall into the traps that you saw before? Wow. Um, Yeah, my... My childhood was extremely challenging, and uh, and you know, looking back now, the only thing I can say, you know, again, um, you know, we were we were raised in a, a Lutheran church. My my grandmother is German, uh, Nana Bell, and, and always Lutheran. So when we were at her house, we'd go to church and we'd go on the holidays. But in part, we never went to church on our own. You know, when we were uh, back home or in Indianapolis, but if we went to visit. Um, so we always had that influence, but it was a God thing because <clears throat> instead of taking that and turning it into bitterness, I vowed that for my kids, they would be one rung higher on the ladder than I was. And I guaranteed that, uh, that they would go to school. I don't care what they did. Um, it's not that I didn't have the opportunity. I was, I didn't have the encouragement to uh, go to school or further my education. It, it just, that wasn't the path that I had to take. Luckily, I went into the Air Force, which changed my life tremendously. Um, but just to make sure 
that they had it better than uh, we did. Yeah. And uh, that, that was our goal. A lot of times it'll go the other way. Uh, we've talked about this before too, um, where the environment you grow up in um, creates this generational uh, consistency where you parent like you were parented and so on and so forth. Or the other side is you say mm -hmm. what you said, which is I want better for my kids than, than what I had. And then I need to be better than right. what I had. And um, that's, that's not easy. How old were you, if you don't mind, how old were you when you went in the Air Force? I was uh, 20 years old. Okay. Just had turned 20. So about the time, pretty close to the time where you had made the decision, right, to, to go into the ministry. Yeah. yeah, about that age. Yep. Okay, last question. So you had your time in the Air Force. You come <laughs> out. You you worked a couple jobs, but then you started at the sanitation department, mm -hmm. and eventually worked your way all the way up to lead the sanitation department, and just retired from the sanitation department in Fort Myers, leaving it in incredible hands, profitable, you know incredible, incredible run as as the head of the department. So clearly leadership qualities. What, because I, I soak these things up. I ask you questions all the time about managing people and, and managing, you know, all kinds of things. Difficult personalities. Does he ask about me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what am I um, doing with this guy? But... Uh, what would you say leadership principles? What are, what are some of the core things that you learned in your in your career? Um, what are some basic principles of leadership that you think are are uh, key for everybody? I think that uh, the leadership style, at the end of the day, um, you got to make hard decisions. And I, at the end of the day, when I walked out in retirement. If I could walk out and people say he was a fair man, that's what I shot for. He's a fair man. So whatever decision I made, and it's hard to do when you had, we had 55 employees and you know, there's some that you like and there's some that, that you don't, but all of them are assets to you. And that's the way I looked at it. You know, we were big sports guys. So it always reverted back to a sports metaphor, right? What's, what can I get out of this guy? He, you know, he's not the best, but I got to find whatever his talent is and get that out of him. If I can get that out of him, he may not be, you know, an A plus recruit, but if I can get, you know, whatever his strength, you know, I'm not going to, he's a duck. I'm not going to make him into a rabbit. Yeah. You know, he, I'm going to make him the best duck he can be and, and work from that. And, and to be fair with every employee, um, was the key and uh, a positive attitude you're going to move forward um, you always had to come in with a positive attitude they're going to feed off of you it's no different than you know your family uh, you know they're going to feed off we're, we're the leaders and we, you walk through that door you know in whatever company your business you're in when you go through that door is you can be as friendly as you want to be and, and have all the but you are the leader and you always have to be the leader and represent the leader, right? So you, you want to be a leader, you got to act like a leader. Yeah. Every single moment you're there because people, you don't think that, but they're looking up to you. They want to be led, right? Or they want to knock you off so they can be the leader. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game, so. What, when you have to make hard decisions, what, what kind of, how do you weigh that out? The hard decisions, you know, really, uh, for for me, the evidence played out. You know, um, we documented everything. And when it came to the time, you know, I hated letting people go, especially, you know, these are people that you knew that had families. But, you know, when you could bring them into the office, you could tell them that this is not going to work out. This is why we've talked about this. This is, this is where we're at. Sorry, see, you know, hope you do well. You know, it's like a Band-Aid. Let's not drag this out. We're, we're moving on. But it was it was cut dry. There was no 
no air, no gray area. If I ever had to discipline or let someone go, it was clear cut. And they knew it, and I knew it. So, yeah. not easy to do. No, no. I had this conversation no, just yesterday uh, <laughs> with a young man about sometimes those hard decisions. <clears throat> you have a tendency, depending on your personality, you have a tendency to drag it out. Right. Um, and what's the maybe kind of dance around? Right. Dance around it. But if you know, if you know you know right. it's the right decision, then the best thing you can do for the other person right. is just be blunt. And you're a big like a proponent of being blunt. You know. So there's there's definitely Well, I think that, that you know, the, the thing that we also stress constantly or I stress constantly is that you know how short life really is. And if you're in a job that you're not happy and I would tell them, you know, we have safety meetings every month. And I tell them, if you're not happy, if you have to stand outside those gates before you come in and grit your teeth and come in and hear work, move on. Yeah. Life is too short. There's something out there for you. Right. Move on. Because, you know, to be somewhere that you don't want to be, you're, you're only, you're hurting the, the company you're at and you're hurting yourself. And you need to make that decision and go on. And, uh, you know. Go and be happy, yeah. but don't be somewhere where you're not happy. You know, who wants to work five years, 10 years, somewhere that you regret or you're coming in and you're just pissing and moaning the whole time you're there. Hey, that just brings morale down. And those are the people, you know, we always said that we could, we could, we felt confident enough that we could teach and train. Mm -hmm. The thing that we couldn't teach or train is attitude and work ethic. Yeah. That's what we look for when we hire someone. Not so much your talent. You can come in as a rock star being able to operate equipment and stuff. But if you had that poor attitude or work ethic, I don't need you. Yeah. You know, I'll take that B plus player uh, who's willing to give everything they have and come in, you know, with a bright good morning and in a hundred times over. And coach them up. Coach them up. Yeah. Since we're on a roll, let's go. Parenting and fatherhood advice. I don't know that I'm good at giving uh, that. Um, there would be a lot of people that say you raised kids and did well. Yeah. But I, I don't. I don't know that. I really know the formula that we use. Um, I mean, loved our kids. Mm -hmm. Wanted the best for them. Uh, a believer in uh, discipline is love. Right, a lot of people don't believe that. Um, kids are hungry for discipline. Yeah. They, you know, they're not going to ask you for it or beg you for it, but they need structure and discipline. Sure. And the more structure and discipline that you could give them, you know, and with you know love, I right? again it goes back to you got to have a good at you. You got to be wanting to be in the family, right? So you're the dad. You know, you got to be happy being the dad. And um, all that structure and discipline, that's going to pay off for them when they get older. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to cling to that. They're going to know that and understand it. And, uh, you know, my goal, uh, and I've told him is, you know, I want him, which he, he is, I want him to be a better father than I was. You know, and, and, you know, we hope that Hudson and Beckett are better fathers than both of us were. I mean, that's our goal. Be better than we were, yeah. you know? I think touching on, on one of the things you said um, with, with discipline, you know, in the, in the moment, kids don't necessarily, uh, they're not, not going to appreciate it. But there's a component of that that, that makes them or helps them to feel safe. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that, um, as a dad, that I think about all the time. You know, I want my kids to feel safe um, and, and not worry about their safety. And there's, there's a component of discipline that maybe not in front of their minds, but in the back of their minds, lends to them feeling safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and, and I'll say this to back that up. You know, at, at dad in, in <clears throat> Joyce's house, my, my stepmom, mm -hmm. it, it was strong discipline. And at my mom's house with my stepdad, there was there was not a lot of discipline. Like, even at a young age, didn't have a bedtime, didn't, you know, like, 
could stay up watching whatever I wanted and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, eventually it got to the point. I mean, when I was older, I got to ch- kind of choose who I spent more time with. Yeah. And I actually picked to be in the house with more discipline because I actually, in, in my heart, I, I did connect that with love. Yeah. That I was like, they actually kicked, like they told me to do my homework. They told me to go to bed. They tell me I can't just eat whatever I want. They told like, and I actually chose that because I, I did associate that with like, they actually cared more. And, and, and that's nothing negative. No, mom. It, it was just two different styles. Yeah. Um, where she thought it, she was being loving. To say like, no, you you can decide and you can learn lessons right. and you like I chose the discipline because I was like, I actually I like that they hold me accountable. I like that I feel safe, mm-hmm. I feel secure, you know. Um, and that's something that we model in our house too. Like we we're we're strong disciplinarians in our house and we're we're not afraid to be. And I do think um, I, I hope it pays off, you know, yeah. in the long run. I think it does so far. I think the other thing about about that is, um, with regard to this discipline, is that your parents have expectations of you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, we know that you're capable of this, and we expect this out of you. So if you're not meeting that, then we're going to discipline you so that you understand that we value you're capable of more. For sure. Yeah. And then going back to a message recently, which was about, you know, God's value in us. Right. And, uh, and his expectations of us. I, I, you know, it... There's something to be said about um, to be said about the, the the expectations that parents put on their kids. Not unreasonable. Um, not trying to live out their glory through their children's mm-hmm. activities and lives, but rather um, we expect we expect that you behave because we know that you're capable of good behavior. We expect that you're respectful because we know that you're capable of being respectful, and, and, and we value that. In you. And, uh, and for kids to recognize that consistency um, in, that, in that, I think, is, is important and clearly. Mm-hmm. This is what, this is the product. Right. <laughs> this is the product. We have, we have, if you can believe this or not, we're over an hour. Um, we're over an hour. Time flies in here, doesn't it? Now, I, I'll be compensated for all the time I'm here, not just the hour, correct? That's correct. <laughs> Actually, the way that we, it's, it's from the time that you leave your home until this is over and you return, <laughs> you're, there's your compensation. It's that mug. <laughs> Joe, thanks so much. No, you're welcome. Thanks for joining. I know that that you weren't necessarily excited about it, but we were definitely excited about having you. Um, and uh, and it, it, it was, uh, I think it'll warm a lot of people's hearts to, to get some more history on uh, on your son. Um, you know that he's well loved here. And, uh, and valued in a big way. And at the same time, he's got this huge responsibility of right. this of this church and this family um, to lead it and to lead it in a godly way and to, to follow Christ uh, accordingly. So I'll say well done. Thank well you. done on this guy. Um, your encouragement in, a, in the trials of his life um, certainly uh, paid off in a, in a big way. And we talk a lot about what Grace Hill I mean, I brought it up recently, what Grace Hill 2080 is going to look like when mm-hmm. we're not around. And he's like, what? I'll still be there. <laughs> when, when we're long since gone um, and, uh, and his, his, uh, his fingerprints will still be all over that place uh, for, for generations to come. So we appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that this summer I'll probably be coming out with the white papers, the untold story. So uh <laughs> You know, the church will be able to get their hands. <laughs> those will be val- boy. You can't so, put a price on those. That'll be this summer. <laughs> coming, coming soon. Thanks again, girl. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate I'm just uh, very proud of uh, everybody here, um, and you know, you can see that uh, just the way the the church has developed. Uh, we we get a chance to pound our chest in Fort Myers, you know, in Florida. Yeah. Uh, so many people ask about him. He's loved there. Um, and, uh, you know, but to see the progress you guys make, we, you know, uh, Joyce and I, uh, you know, feel, we like to feel that we're a little part of that. Every every step is taken, you know, we're we're glad that we're a part of that. And uh, I think he's got a fantastic team around him. And uh, that, that, that's what makes it is, is the people that you surround yourself with, you know. It's, obviously, it's not being the most gifted, but it's surrounding yourself with those people. Well, going, going back to what you said, um, 
uh, about managing people in, mm -hmm. in your in your career that you recognize you know where their talents are and um, and, and you can help you know develop those certainly help cover your weaknesses yeah for yeah. sure and and I, yeah, yeah I do yeah and he knows oh, absolutely he knows like yes. he he uh, had a team around him uh, but but it goes back to the, the relationships he, yeah there were some super smart and capable people across the board marketing and all these other things but if they didn't like him <laughs> or didn't believe in him um, or didn't think that 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 he could do it I. I don't doubt that things would look a lot different today. Um, but from day one, you know, day one, well, not day one, because day one we didn't choose him, but when we actually chose him the second time around, from that day one, right, yeah, he was universally loved. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Keep him humble. Keep him humble. Oh, we talk about that yeah. often. Not just him. <laughs> not just him. Yeah. We, uh, we, I would say we both recognize um, the propensity for for people in leadership positions um, of churches to to uh, to go off the rails, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, there's a lot of accountability here. And, that's you know, not just churches. That's that's what takes down most companies and stuff is is pride. You know that it does. that sense of not. You know, when you, you no longer think it's them helping you, but it's you, you know, dragging them along. So. Pride before the fall. Absolutely. Yeah. He does, he does a pretty remarkable job. <laughs> Given how talented he is, he does a really good job of keeping that in check. I'll say that. So. Thank Better you. than me. <laughs> 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 and with that, and God bless. And God Thank bless. you. Thank you. Very much. Hey, hey, you made it. <laughs>